afternoon, good morning, good evening uh, to everybody on this call, depending where you are. Uh, thank you so much um, uh, for joining us uh, today uh, for this uh, you know, quick one hour conversation that we're gonna have uh, to talk about uh, the global need for uh, prostheses uh, and care of amputees. Um, so for everybody, my name is Kieran Ugarwal Harding. I'm the director of the Harvard Global Orthopedics Collaborative. Uh, we're a group of trainees and surgeons based at Harvard, but all over the world with collaborations in many countries, uh, focused on improving access to orthopedic trauma and uh, surgical care. Um, so we put on these webinars just sort of uh, to have a conversation, to meet amazing innovators like the three people that you will meet today uh, who are our speakers, and to just have conversations that focus our attention on the needs of the poor and vulnerable with regards to trauma care uh, and, um, and rehabilitation and reconstruction. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to our moderator today, Sophia, uh, who is uh, uh, going to take us through this conversation. So thank you guys all for joining. Uh, we'll re record the session just so that you guys all know. Uh, and please do, you know, turn on your cameras and join the, join the conversation if you feel willing. So go, go ahead, Sophia. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Kieran. So as Kieran mentioned, I'm Sophia Mavramadis. I'm a third year medical student and I'll be co-moderating today with um, Kieran. So thank you all for being here today and joining us for our webinar, webinar, Global Amputee Care, Ability and Access. A special thank you to our panelists, Dr. Mengistu Gebriohanes, an orthopedic surgeon from Ethiopia, Ms. Laura Magni, co-founder of prosthetic company Circle Leg, and Dr. Matt Ratto, um, chief science officer of the nonprofit NIA Technologies. And so a few housekeeping rules that Kieran uh, kind of touched upon already you could please keep your microphones muted until the Q&A session at the end. Um, that would be greatly appreciated. Feel free to use the chat function to submit any questions. And today's webinar will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So a quick introduction about today's webinar. Um, the webinar today is a, regarding global amputee care in low and middle income countries. And it's an incredibly important topic According to estimates from the World Health Organization, approximately 35 to 40 million people around the world need prostheses or orthesis and rehabilitation ser services. And the majority of these individuals live in low and middle income countries. In fact, about 80% of people with disabilities worldwide live in low and middle income countries. And only 10% of these people have the prosthetic and assistive devices that they require. So without the necessary assistive devices they require, many of these individuals feel isolated from their communities and are subjected to stigma and prejudice from the societies they live in. So that's why we're really glad to have you all here with us today to discuss and learn more about this topic and why we're especially grateful to our panelists who are working really hard in addressing this unmet, unmet health need in these um, countries. So without further ado, um, let's get started. I have the distinct privilege of introducing our first speaker, Dr. Mengistu Gabriel-Hanes. He is an orthopedic surgeon and assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Hawassa University Comprehensive Specialized Hospital um, in Hawassa, Ethiopia. And he's also the principal investigator for the Ethiopian Bone Center Associated Dis Disability Study. So thank you so much, Dr. Gabriel-Hanes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sophie. Did you see my slide, please? We can see it. Yeah, perfect. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, this is a big privilege for me to be here uh, to give a talk on uh, Amputee Care, Everything and Access. Uh, so I don't have any disclosure uh, present. Uh, whenever we talk about amputation, uh, amputation is one of the commonest procedures that we did in uh, resource limited setup in every low and middle income country due to the high prevalence of this uh, road traffic accident, war injury, the presence of malignancy, and uh, some of uh, severe infection due to delayed presentation of our, pa our patients, uh, open fracture or other patients, they would get complicated and uh, end up with amputation. So this all uh, will make amputation to be one of the uh, procedures that is done in every center where orthopedic surgeons are available, as well as uh, plastic surgeons. Uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the big points to raise uh, when you talk about amputation is the uh, community or the cultural discrimination that the people have about the patient with amputation. Uh, 
So I will uh, present that one as well uh, in my subsequent slides. Uh, just as an introduction, uh, when you see the major limb amputation, uh, I try to see different papers from different countries like uh, uh, from Nigeria, Malawi, and the Ethiopian uh, Series Center. Uh, these are the four major type of amputation. I didn't include any race or uh, digital amputation, hip or knee disarticulation. Rather, what I present here is, as you see, from uh, the first column type of amputation, uh, above the amputation, below the amputation, above below and the below below. So this is a uh, major amputation that's performed in uh, every center. Uh, so this is a 2017 publication from Nigeria. It shows that upper, uh, lower extremity amputation is by far common in uh, more than uh, almost nearly 85% uh, uh, of the case. It is uh, uh, lower limb amputation followed by uh, upper limb. It is uh, almost the same in uh, Malawi as well. So the lower limb amputation is also common. When it came to Ethiopia, especially one of the papers which was uh, published from Black Nine Hospital, this is a third column, I mean, it is a 10 year uh, retrospective study, uh, including uh, 100 uh, pediatric patients. It is all about pediatrics, not all amputation. So it shows that like upper extremity amputation is kind of uh, commonest than uh, uh, lower extremity. It is due to the fact that uh, the most common indication for uh, these amputations are uh, traditional bone center associated gangrene or complication. Uh, there is other study published from Mekali in uh, northern part of Ethiopia in 2018, uh, including 87 patients. Uh, again, upper extremity um, uh, amputation is low uh, when compared to that of the lower. There are also other type of amputation actually reported. Uh, our data from Hawassa, it is uh, not yet published. We are preparing the data. Uh, we try to see the three years uh, data. Some of them, the data is uh, retrospectively collected and the kind of mixed uh, prospective as well. Uh, total of 312 patients get uh, this service or they get amputated uh, due to different uh, indications. Uh, nearly 50% of the amputation is then in uh, lower extremity as well. Uh, when you see uh, how was I experienced uh, over the last three years from April uh, to 2019 to May 2022, uh, this 300 amputation was done. It means uh, two or more amputations per week is performed. So you can imagine how it is uh, common. And uh, when we see the age of the patient, uh, it is really in the reproductive age. The average age is uh, 33 years, uh, reaching from 1 to 89 with standard deviation of uh, 90.6 years. So the meaning is most of the patients who end up with amputation are young, reproductive, and productive age group, so that the need of uh, prostate picking is uh, very high for them. Uh, for uh, no reason, males are highly affected uh, because uh, trauma as well as other conditions are uh, involved in uh, male patients. When you say amputation for amputation, it is almost similar with other countries. The leading indication is peripheral arterial disease in 37%, followed by trauma. Trauma in general, it accounts 35%. Uh, uh, mangled extremity due to the trauma account 70.9. And TDS, traditional consider associated complication, account 70%. 70% of all uh, the amputations that we did, which means this amputation is 100% preventable amputation, as I try to name here in this area. So these are the way we have. 11.2% contribution from severe infection, which is not responded by repeated deridement and uh, culture guided therapy. Malignancy are 10% and severe pain and others contribute also uh, some percentage. Probably, if you see other centers report like the Macale or uh, the Capitol Hospital report, uh, burn will, uh, uh, will be the top for probably because of the burn center. In our since we don't have that one, the other indication will lead, uh, we are uh, leading. What are the challenges of amputation? Uh, whenever you discuss uh, the, the probability of having amputation for the trauma patient or other patient, including the minor patient, there is a big concern. The patient uh, initially uh, refused for 100%. They will say, no, I will not have amputation. Rather, I prefer to die with the uh, disease that I have. It is due to the community stigmatization or uh, discrimination. Uh, in I don't know if it is common for all uh, countries around the world. In most low and middle income countries, as far as I understand, it is uh, scenarios uh, the same. Uh, there is a patient with amputation. They will have uh, this community-based discrimination. 
That is why the family, as well as the patient, they will refuse until they get convinced with the severest uh, disease condition. Like once they get severe condition, uh, in which they try other option and uh, fail to respond, they will argue, uh, agree with the uh, uh, amputation. Uh, the other point will be to see from the physician perspective. In uh, some scenarios, in the health professional community and others, uh, amputation is considered as a treatment of failure. Uh, they didn't consider like amputation is one of the treatment uh, options that we have. Rather, uh, it is safe to be uh, like uh, amputation is offered once every uh, other treatment of is failed. So, treatment of failure concept should be should be understood well. I mean, it is not. Uh, I know amputation is the last resort, but it is not a treatment of failure. Rather, it is one of the pillars. Is the treatment of such cases like malignancy or uh, severely crushed extremities in uh, the case of trauma. When, when I come to amputation care, uh, first I need to say something about the uh, aim of post-amputation. So all in all, when we talk about uh, post-amputee care, uh, the whole aim is to return patients back to their uh, ordinary life and uh, do their daily activity, their daily activity. So in order to achieve uh, this aim, uh, the post-amputee care we started preoperatively. We need to prepare the patient. Once amputation is a mess, if it is an inevitable amputation, once we know that, we need to discuss with the family, we need to discuss with the patient and prepare the patient to have the prosthetic fitting or uh, this rehabilitation protocol uh, to get prepared uh, before the amputation even. So the care should be, uh, it is a continuum of care and should be started preoperatively. And the other most important thing will be, we need to link the patient immediately when they get discharged from the hospital. What we see in each uh, or daily clinic is the patient will have amputation at third months or even uh, six months, they didn't get linked with the prosthetic centers that we have. That is a big problem. So this two things should be considered strictly. The, the care should be started appropriately and we need to link uh, early. I will, I will, I will uh, say something why we need to link early. When we uh, see the Ethiopian uh, scenario, uh, we did amputation for processes. Uh, as you all know, there are two concepts, uh, amputation for processes versus process for amputation. What we are doing is, we are doing amputation for processes, meaning we don't have a such uh, wide variety or wide option of uh, processes to fit for each amputation. So whenever you do baloney amputation, it should be in optimum length. If not, or if the stamp is like amorphous or don't fit with the processes, the patient uh, will be a crunch user for uh, life. So whenever we do amputation, uh, it should be well planned, I mean, uh, because we don't have uh, a process for every uh, amputation, like uh, short amputation. Uh, the other point in Ethiopia, what we have is uh, lower limb processes for uh, appropriately than below the amputation and uh, above the amputation. It's the same for the, if it is high AKA above the amputation, the process fitting will be difficult and the patient will be either wheelchair based or uh, crunch user. Uh, post amputee care service package, it has uh, four big components. Uh, this service package will include the most important will be psychological support. We need to support the patient as well as the family, uh, physiotherapy, mobility device, including crunch, brace, and wheelchair. And the most important thing and the uh, center of uh, today's discussion is a custom fitted uh, prosthetic limb. So these four are the most important thing. In most low and middle income countries, the uh, amputee rehabilitation program uh, will be based on these four things. Uh, the first one is government run uh, program, which means uh, prosthetic center, prosthetic orthos center will be established by the government and run by the government. Most of the time they have a system failure. So the institution is there, the, the name is there, but uh, when you go to there, uh, they can't do prosthetic fitting for patients. I mean, uh, due to the system, uh, due to the material and the like, the, the, the lack of uh, doing their activity. The second option is government to government program. Uh, this is a kind of, uh, for example, if the country is involved in war, uh, like our country in the northern part of Ethiopia, uh, some other governments uh, will offer uh, the amputee rehabilitation uh, program with the package. Like uh, USAID, for example, that is known that they will help in the post-war uh, uh, rehabilitation, including this, uh, uh, this uh, prosthetic fitting. The most common uh, scenario that you see here and there is uh, non-governmental uh, organization help. Uh, and uh, almost all of uh, 
the center that we have in Ethiopia, they are supported by ICRC, International Committee of Red Cross, almost 100%. Uh, in one or another way, uh, they, uh, they get supported with this uh, NGOs, as well as uh, World Rehabilitation Fund, they are working strongly uh, on rehabilitation uh, cascades, especially post-war rehabilitation. The fourth one, uh, which is also common in Ethiopia, is a private voluntary organization as well as region service organizations. Uh, these are uh, NGOs, uh, uh, kind of NGOs uh, based on religious uh, perspective, as they are doing a great job in Ethiopia as well and in most African uh, countries. Uh, this is the data that I get from the Ethiopian Hills uh, Directory, and I try my best to contact people from the different center. If I missed any center, we are working on a rehabilitation protocol, especially on prostate. And uh, this rehabilitation center in Ethiopia, uh, we have 11 regions. The country, uh, the Ethiopian country is organized in 11 regions plus two uh, city administrative. And we got this one in Redwa. If you see the distribution, uh, four of uh, the rehabilitation center occurs in Addis Ababa. Uh, Afar, it doesn't have any. Amara region, it has two. Uh, one. Redwa and Oromia, it has uh, three centers. Uh, it's Idama, uh, in Hamas, we have one. South uh, Asia and Tigray, they have one each. So, in general, the centers, the prosthetic centers that we have uh, in the country is uh, 14. When you see most of them, they are really uh, NGO based and uh, they are working on uh, more of orthotic rather than prosthetic as well. Very few work on the prosthetic as well. What are the challenges for the post amputee care in Ethiopia? One, the community awareness. The patients themselves, the patient families, the religion as well as community leader, they didn't think like once the patient gets amputated, uh, they don't think like they will get uh, benefits from a process fitting or other supporters. That's one thing. Rather, there is this uh, discrimination of the patient with amputee. That is a bad uh, scenario. So we need to create a big awareness for the community as well. Another thing is accessibility. Due to different reasons, this prosthetic center will not accessible for every patient, especially those who come from uh, rural areas. They didn't get the chance uh, to get to be seen by a prosthetic center most of the time. Uh, one of the points is the distance to receive the service. As, I, as uh, you see from my previous slide from here, we have only uh, 14 centers and uh, four of them, it is uh, concentrated in Addis. So, those who came from Afar, Gambella, Harar, or Somali, it is less likely to get a uh, good prosthetic center. That is a problem. The third problem is the uh, ability of centers themselves, the prosthetic orthotic centers themselves, to provide the prosthetic care. Some of the professionals who get graduated with a prosthetic uh, profession uh, due to absence of different things. I mean, they change their uh, profession, and some of them, those who I know actually, change their profession to accounting and something like that. And so there are a big uh, professional gap and uh, there is a big uh, problem with raw materials which are important to mold the prosthetic, to give the prosthetic care. The first most important thing also will be the professional communication gap. There is a big gap. As a surgeon, we will do amputation and we fail to link the patient with that of the prosthetic professional or uh, there is a gap between the hospital workers, the physician and the nurses and other staff who are working on the wound and uh, amputation service versus the rehabilitation, uh, the rehabilitation professionals, especially prosthetic uh, professionals. Uh, when you see the ability, what they are doing, uh, the prosthetic orthotic centers that we have in our country, what they are doing. Uh, we have a few centers, as I uh, tried to mention, only 14 centers for 120 million population throughout the country. Most of the, most of they are doing other jobs rather than prosthetics. They are working on the preparation of crunches, uh, give a physiotherapy service widely, especially Cheshire Center. They are well known in giving high high quality physiotherapy service, uh, not only for amputee care for, and for others as well. And they are working on orthotic uh, service like for patients with CP, polio, or others. Very few did the prosthetic limb, and specifically they did for VKA and AK. That's a big problem. Those patients who have upper extremity amputation, they didn't, uh, they are not lucky to have a prosthetic, good prosthetic. Most of the service uh, is funded by NHOs and uh, they are given for free. So there is a sustainability issue. Uh, you may get uh, prosthetic fitting for uh, one month and for the first, the coming five or six months, uh, you hear like there is no uh, uh, material or something like that. So we need to have the kind of uh, cost sharing mechanism. I don't know with whom, with the patient, with the family or the community. 
or some, someone else. And uh, we need to impact the government as well to have adequate budget allocation to them. Access, uh, we, when we discuss about this uh, webinar, uh, I guess uh, six weeks back, uh, we try to call for all patients. Uh, those who have a billionaire amputation, we call for around 48 patients and ask it as their six to eight menses. And more than 85% of them, they didn't visit process center at all due to this three reason. One is distance. They, they don't know where to go. And it, they are really living in far distance. The other is cost. This cost could be travel cost, their meal cost, and other costs. And uh, the other big uh, gap that we identify from these 48 patients was poor linkage of patients to the center. The patient will have amputation in the hospital, they will stay five to seven days, or the, I don't know, they will finish their hospital course, and they are discharged without telling uh, them to be linked to the center. But we need to link this patient when we discharge from the hospital. Why not in uh, Saturday or Tuesday? It will be very helpful for uh, process professionals in order to measure the limb as well as to prepare the stamp. The stamp itself needs a special preparation. So we need to link uh, that one in. This is one of the gap why patient didn't get fitted with the process. So I can say like a few patients received the service. Uh, the other second point will be absence of prosthetic service uh, due to lack of materials and professionals. When we contact them, they say like they don't have uh, the service and they, they have a long waiting list for uh, patients. The other thing, even those uh, patients who are fitted for processes, uh, they have a lot of complaints, especially they are not happy. They, it causes uh, the process itself cause uh, discomfort. They have stamp alteration and difficulty of working with uh, processes. These are some of uh, the points. Coming to the access, this is what you can see. As an orthopedic surgeon or as an, uh, one of the uh, vital component of the care, what can we do? That will be the most important thing. For our country, I feel like we need to have a national rehabilitation hub in one or in another way. We need to impact the government and we need to have this national rehab center, which is known by everybody and uh, in which the care is uh, will be given to them. The center should be fully uh, uh, equipped and uh, we need to have uh, adequate number and uh, quality of professionals. That's also important. Having a building itself, it doesn't give any shit for the patient. So fully equipped and it should be well staffed. That is uh, number one. Number two, we need to train professionals, especially prosthetic professionals. Uh, they are really uh, important part of the care for the amputated uh, patients. If we want to have to rehab this uh, we are in need of them. So we uh, we need to uh, train for them. And timely service should be given for the patient in order to achieve this timely service. As a physician, we need to start to link the patient preoperatively. We need to communicate with them and discuss as uh, there is a big option of uh, process fitting. Then they can continue their uh, daily life. That's important. The other thing, early linkage with prosthetic for two reasons. Uh, it is really important. The fourth and uh, other important point to consider is we need to have a multidisciplinary team approach, like others, uh, tumor or other uh, team for the post amputee care. We need to have also a multidisciplinary team approach, including orthopedic surgeons, nurses, physiotherapists, and the prosthetic professionals. And the care should be, as I repeatedly say, appropriately and continue until the patient return back to their activity. Finally, we need to collaborate. We need to collaborate. This collaboration, uh, we need to collaborate with the patient, with the physician, and the prosthetic uh, professional uh, engagement will be uh, paramount to uh, give this step. As a summary, uh, I can put these three dots. One, the amputee care or the post amputation care is a continuum of care and it needs a multidisciplinary approach, a holistic approach. And this, we all need to start the treatment before amputation so that uh, we will be effective. This is a picture of uh, one of the prosthetic volunteers in our country called uh, Salomon Amara. I took this picture from his kid uh, with his uh, pediatric patient to fit with the uh, prosthesis. So this is what I can say, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mengistu. Very interesting. Um, you know, I, I was also, the one question I had for you also is, um, how has the war in Tigray changed the volume of patients that you're seeing who are in need of uh, in need of prostheses. Are you seeing a lot of amputations because of the war? Yeah, perfect. So, uh, you know, I am in the southern part of Ethiopia and uh, those, my colleagues who, who are working in the northern part of Ethiopia, 
uh, we were discussing this point and uh, they did a lot of amputation actually. And even in ours, uh, we get uh, 500, 540 patients, a total a trauma patient. And of them, we did around eight amputation, eight amputation for gangrenous due to uh, vascular injury, neglected vascular injury. Yeah, it is, uh, it, it creates a big, a big burden for the prosthetic uh, in the country, it is obvious. Uh, the issue with this uh, war related jury is once the wound is healed, the government collects them and they took them. There is a center for the military uh, people uh, around Addis Ababa. Uh, they took there and they put them in the waiting list. Uh, if the wound is fine, if the once they get measured and fitted for processes, they will fit them. Uh, that is what I know. Uh, mm. Yeah, I mean, you you highlighted a lot of challenges that the Ethiopian you know patient will face. Um, you know, I I think it's very important the point that you make about collaboration and the multidisciplinary team. You know, including psychological support and also social support for these patients. I think that that's a very important topic. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear from the other two speakers about the issues of sustainability and access and capacity locally, because I think you know this this model that you've just highlighted, Mengistu of international organizations like ICRC basically donating to support local access to, to prostheses. I mean, it's wonderful that that's, that's there, but obviously it's perhaps not scalable um, and sustainable long-term, especially as Ethiopia continues to grow and many other African countries continue to grow and their needs will grow. Um, so thank you for that very interesting presentation. I mean, there's obviously such a huge need out there and you did a great job of highlighting some of the challenges that must be addressed. Um, so Sophia, I'll go ahead and hand it to you to introduce our next speaker. Perfect. And thank you for that presentation, Dr. Gabriel Hannes. Um, so next we have Miss Laura Magni. She is co-founder of the Swiss Kenyan Social Enterprise Circle Egg, which develops lower limb prosthetics. With her background in biomechanics and engineering, and her experience in low and middle income countries in the health and energy fields, she's acting as a bridge at Circle Egg, bringing together product and business development. So thank you, Ms. Magni. Hello and welcome everyone, actually. It's very nice to be here as well. Uh, I'm Laura Magni, one of the co-founders of Project Circle Egg, um, where actually we are a Swiss Kenyan social enterprise developing like appropriate lower limb prosthetic systems out of mainly recycled plastic uh, for and in East Africa. It's very interesting to have heard about Mengistu as well because um, experience because we also saw that the challenges are very huge and big in the, in the country. We know that 80% of the amputees are actually residing in low and middle income countries and one out of 10 normally has access to, to prosthetic care in general. And we saw that the majority of the, the challenges are for sure the, short of, or the shortage of affordable quality prosthetics in the country. Uh, many of the amputees that can actually not, not access and don't afford that. And also the absence of local and sustainable solutions. So um, the majority of the um, uh, prosthetic systems are produced in high income countries, and then they need to actually be imported in the, um, for instance, in East Africa, which brings actually to many delays and import taxes, and it makes it very complicated, not just for the amputees, but also for the local uh, workshops. And another big point that we tried really to, to face is the stigmatization that amputees face and the, the, the old families. And often after amputation, we see that there is, no, there is a lack of resources and a lack of awareness of where actually they can get the care that they need. And the, in Africa, in East Africa, for instance, the major cause of amputation is um, traffic accident. And often it, it suddenly happens and then people are quite lost and they don't know what to do and how to find the, the right care. That's why at Project Circle, like we actually try to tackle the challenge from different perspectives and really looking at them with an holistic approach. First of all, we, we, we develop a um, high quality prosthetic uh, system and service because we think that it's not just about the components, but also the service around. And uh, as we mentioned before, also training um, and having like experienced um, technicians and prosthetists and orthopedists as well. On the other side, we, we really focus on the sustainability and local production. So we think that uh, the only way to really tackle this challenge as well to produce locally in Kenya in a sustainable way that is uh, following actually the circular economy principle. And finally, thinking about solutions that can support a broader accessibility and increasing the demand, especially on the financial aspect. 
So our holistic approach, actually, uh, we, we place always the, the user at the center and we, we collaborate together because we think also that collaboration is one of the key, uh, of the key in order to, to tackle the challenge. And uh, for us, the user are, of course, on one side uh, and the beneficiaries with the amputees. And so really understanding what are their needs and their requirements, or so how do they live the daily life, but as well like the, the processes. So in order that we can provide and develop like a system that they can use in a very easy and um, simple and straightforward way. On the other side, we spend a lot of time also in East Africa, of course, <laughs> because we need to understand what are their requirements for them, how does their daily life look like, and how can we provide a system that uh, supports that. And um, we also include ourselves into, we really think that it's important to be part of the global framework, in particular the, the SDG, SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, here you can see, I, I like it, the one that we're actually directly tackling to our um, work. So the first pillar I mentioned before is about product, providing high quality prosthetic care. And uh, here you see actually one of the amputees that had the, the, our system last year in our usability testing in Uganda. And uh, this is actually the previous prototype um, that uh, is, we, we took now three years to really de de develop a, a system and a product that is uh, ready to be put on the market. And we always like work a bit in combination to understand what are the materials that we can use that are available locally and they are robust enough, but at the same time, so a design that it looks nice and appealing and especially for the entities that we can tackle also the part of the stigmatization and the confidence of the user. At the same time, thinking about modularity and customization. So modularity means in the terms that we have different components and we also fit for above and below knee amputation. And also that uh, depending on, it can be easily adjusted in terms of size, weight, activity uh, and activity level. But at the same time, if we think about modularity is um, the thing that if some parts after some years actually get used and they, they need to be repaired, it's easily like a repairable. So you don't need to change, for instance, the, the full prosthetics or the full components in order to get like um, a good system. And, um, and finally, also thinking about performance and stability. So we really want a stable and robust because also if you think about the environmental aspect where the, this procedure will be used, of course, in cities, but also in many rural areas where the majority of amputees uh, are. Uh, so we need a very stable, stable system. And on the other uh, side, we want also a performance system. So a system that you can easily use also for different activity level and that you can use for uh, in, in different circumstances. On the other side, uh, thinking about the prosthetists and orthopedists. So how can we make also their life easy thinking about the infrastructures uh, that they have available in the, the local context? On one side, so we really think how can we make it easy and fast to fit because sometimes procedures, uh, not just of import, but also the, the fitting of the system takes very long time. And that's why also the, not many amputees can be fit. Also due also to the lack of uh, prosthetists in the area. On the other side, we thought, okay, it's very important that it's locally made because then it's very close to the beneficiary. And finally, that no additional tools are required in order to fit the system, but that they have access to everything that they need in order to, to fit the patient. And uh, another very important part, I said, we're, right now we're actually in this industrialization phase. And so it's the, the transfer between like a prototype to a final product that we will test again this um, coming September in, in Uganda for the final uh, usability testing. And um, another important part is that we developed the system from the beginning uh, based on the EU MDR, so the medical device regulation, in order to make sure that actually that the quality and the process that we utilize is, are following also the um, international standard. Um, another aspect, uh, very important for CERCLEG is definitely the training, because of course we can provide very good uh, components, very good prosthetic system, but then if it's not properly fit and adjusted, uh, the, the service will not have the quality we really look for. And that's why um, one of like capacity building is also one of the focus of our activities. We really see that we need to accompany actually the, um, the processes and the orthopedist in order to get the, the information and also the, the knowledge in order to be able to do it. And that's why we are organizing workshops and we will actually add it also in the curriculum of the major training schools in the region. And as well, thinking about a sort of like certification so that we make sure that the processes that will have the certification will be able to provide the quality of the service. 
Here you can see actually Lawrence and Aline, that are two of the entities that they tried our system and uh, we, from whom we received a very good feedback. But as I said at the beginning, we really collaborate. So I want to test, we tested a lot in Switzerland as well, but also in, in Uganda and in the East African countries, because it's very important to get the feedback. How does it feel? That's why it took also so long to develop the, the product, because we really wanted to have a, a product that is um, satisfying in every aspect, uh, the needs of the local entities. And for instance, we see that it was very confident in terms of late likewise, like many of the prosthetics are very heavy and that's why many of the entities they don't like to use it. Or for instance, for Ali, you see, we actually covered um, the system with, uh, with um, synthetic leather and uh, it really looks like uh, the color and the, the appearance of the skin. And this, uh, it's, it's very important because of course there are some young uh, amputees that feel very young and also very open-minded amputees that they feel very comfortable in showing, for instance, a mechanical prosthetic system or the other that they feel much more comfortable in having a more um, similar to the human body system. On the other side, we um, another pillar very important for us is the creation of a sustainable model locally. And as I say, sustainable, so following the, the circular um, um, economy principle, but as well, as well locally, so produced in Nairobi, in Kenya. Here you can see actually the surplus cycle. So how do we produce? We normally use, uh, we, we collaborate with partners that uh, re they recycle this earth plastic, and then we, we mix it together with glass fibers in order to make like a system that is robust enough to sustain also the weight of the body and to perform different activities. We use injection molding production in order to be also scalable and uh, produce in large quantity. And then finally, we distribute to the different PNO centers. And there uh, they will fit and they will actually repair the parts that are broken. And as well, we will, uh, one, some parts, because of course we try to make it as um, much um, like long lasting as possible. But of course, after like using it every day for many years, some of the parts will deteriorate. And then we, they will return actually into the circlex cycle. And we collect uh, the circlex material because it's made of mainly of polypropylene and the PET, but also material from other prosthetic systems that can be reintroduced into the cycle and used for creation of uh, new prosthetic systems. Uh, sustainable model because we have uh, yeah, a headquarter in Switzerland, but the others, the circle like hub is actually would be in Nairobi, where we are very close to our supply chain. So the, the collaborating with different man material suppliers, manufacturers, and as well our customers that are mainly like uh, hospitals. Uh, so private hospital, public hospitals, NGOs, and finally like working as well with the local organization for supporting all other activities, uh, especially for the psychological support and community awareness. And, and that we call about accessibility programs and empowering programs. The Circle like Hub uh, that will be based in Nairobi will actually focus on four main areas. From one side, the assembly, quality control, and the logistic of the prosthetic device, as well the, the training and knowledge transfer for the prosthetics and orthopedists in order to have a, like a space where we can um, provide this type of knowledge transfer. Uh, disability resource sharing and development. So really thinking, okay, what are uh, the other resources that, um, that the amputees need in order to, to be reintroduced also in their community life and in the societal life. And finally, we, we also scout the different like AT innovation uh, entrepreneurs or innovation companies. And we see that there is a lot of potential to co-create together and to really find a place where we can centralize our resources and then be effective uh, uh, for like the majority of people with disability, not just with uh, prosthetics. Um, um, the first hub uh, will be in, uh, in Nairobi, but uh, we see that uh, we already received so many um, demands and actually support from other uh, regions in the world. And uh, we plan to, to develop, because our model is actually modular and easily scalable. We are planning actually to, to scale then in other regions, especially in West Africa, but also South America and uh, Southeast Asia. And um, on the third, on the last third and last pillars, we, we were thinking and really focusing on supported border accessibility. And uh, in this case, we focus on two main uh, areas. On one side, the financial accessibility, and on the other side, the empowerment programs. And this is really linked on one side to the stigmatization of entities that really give the, the resources and the support and the different um, matters. From the accessibility side, uh, we want to develop we're actually starting to talk together with other institutions locally to really develop financial mechanism solutions for entities. And these can be, for instance, microloans or different um, uh, financial mechanisms in partnership with different institutions, can be NGOs, can be government, government to make sure that more and more entities will access to prosthetic care in general. 
but also to collaborate with cooperation to finance uh, and to subsidize actually the research provision. And finally, also thinking about empowerment programs. Uh, so how can we deliver um, a service that is actually supporting an entities? And as, as we said before, on the psychological level, on the community awareness, on the accessibility. And for this, we are developing the information manual because mo most of the people, of the entities lack of uh, awareness and the resources. And as well, thinking about how to reintroduce them in the, um, in the, in the job, like uh, to, to help them find the new jobs and uh, really training them, in developing new skills. And finally, a very important aspect is the empowerment campaign. So, so to our, uh, our communication is really based on showing um, the possibility of amputees to restart or to start a new life. Right? So that with amputation, your life doesn't end, but actually you have new potential for, for changes. This is the team, the CERTLEC team. Uh, we are mainly based, as I said, in Switzerland, but uh, Shama is actually the one of the team members based in Nairobi. They will go in the, in the next month. And um, we are in the, timeline-wise, we are in the industrialization phase. So soon uh, we will certify the product. Uh, we are setting up the supply chain and we will start the provision uh, of prosthetics in um, 2023, middle of the year. And then there will be the scalability phase and the ramp-up phase in 2024. And uh, yeah, here you can see as the last picture of um, or my presentation, the um, bold booth. Uh, it's part one of the, the first um, campaign, uh, awareness campaign that we've done. Started like we launched it last year. And here there are Lawrence, uh, Charlie and Alex. Uh, that they are three of our ambassadors. We're really happy to collaborate with. And they are part of one of the organizations that we are actually the, the um, self-help uh, network in Uganda. They're really doing great work. And to bring forward actually the mobile um, freedom of mobility for everyone. Voila. <laughs> With this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you, Laura. Wow, very interesting, amazing journey that you guys have had from uh, conception of this idea specifically for this context and then actually implementing a really fantastic organization here. Um, so <laughs> I had a few questions for you. Um, but in the interest of time, why don't we save them for after uh, Matt's presentation? Because I think there may be some overlap there. Um, so, Sophia, do you want to introduce the, our next speaker? Definitely. And thank you, Laura. That was an amazing presentation. So last but not least, we have Dr. Matt Ratto. Um, Dr. Ratto received his PhD from UCSD and has received numerous fellowships in the fields of information science and digital humanities. He is the Associate Professor in the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto and the Bell University Labs Chair in Human-Computer Interactions. He is Chief Science Officer of NIA Technologies, a nonprofit organization that provides 3D printing resources for rehabilitation clinics in low and middle income countries and Chief Technology Officer for Readout House. Thank you, Dr. Rado. Thanks, Sophia, for that introduction. And and thanks, Kieran, also for uh, uh, this invitation to speak. I, I have to say I was going through and editing some of my slides because I was wanted to respond to and support so many of these great uh, statements and positions that we've heard, uh, both from Dr. Uh, Mangesha and also from uh, Laura as well. And so I'll try to provide a little bit of context to a project that I've been working on since about 2014, uh, which is a nonprofit called NIA Technologies. Um, and I will try to get to a couple of maybe statements about that uh, project and sort of guide things we've learned along the way that might be useful um, for, for, for people who are attending this talk. So Nia, just to give you a little bit of, of a background, came out of a research project that I ran at the University of Toronto in, in uh, 2014. It's currently a nonprofit social enterprise uh, deeply affiliated with Hope and Healing International which is a charity that supports a number of rehabilitation clinics in uh, Africa and Southeast Asia. Our primary work involves the development of what we call, and deployment of what we call 3D printability, which is a digital uh, prosthetic and orthotic tool chain for use in rehabilitation clinics and LMICs. And it's primarily focused on um, uh, really a, a very focused and specific uh, set of users, disabled children, so pediatric patients. Um, and specifically focused actually on the development really of, uh, or the production, I should say, of really two things. Um, transtibial prosthetic sockets, so below the knee, 
prosthetic uh, sockets made to be integrated with ICRC componentry. I'll show you that here in just a second. Um, as and also uh, simple AFOs. Um, now I could go on and on about why those were the chosen um, uh, interventions, um, but I, uh, I'll. I'll I'll say it quickly and just, just that we saw those as the ones that were most in need on one hand, uh, based on uh, the WHO's uh, guidelines and uh, statistics, and also that they were the things that we, we thought we could possibly intervene in. Um, I'll say one more thing about that actually before I move on, and that is to say our specific intervention there was, was, uh, was actually not to make a better prosthetic necessarily, it was to make a prosthetic that was as good as the ICRC polypropylene technology in use in a range of the clinics that we work in, but to speed up the production of those uh, from one week, which was the typical time they were, they were taking to produce them to one day. And again, um, actually Dr. Mengesha mentioned a number of reasons why that, is, uh, that could be potentially important. Uh, primarily focused uh, not just on sustainability in terms of dollar amounts, but sustainability in terms of how uh, accessibility uh, to uh, people in those contexts um, and the lack of prosthetic resources in many of these places. We've got a number of research partners and funders, which I won't go into, um, I'm not happy to talk about. And I will say I, I should have a disclosure here. I, I did I don't have one in here except to say I'm deeply, deeply embedded in these, uh, these, these contexts uh, and this, this nonprofit and, and deeply committed to its success. Just to give you a sense of what we're working with, um, uh, our goal uh, was from the beginning to integrate with ICRC's um, transtibial prosthesis program. That was also because many of the people in the clinics we were working with have been trained on this technology and our goal is to to support it, primarily through the, the production, uh, again, of custom the custom parts rather than the injection molded parts. Um, so our socket that we uh, produce integrates with, for example, the componentry you see there on the right-hand side of the screen. So what is it? Well, it's a thing called 3D printability. Um, we've, got, we've been developing it for many years now. We've gone through a lot of different pieces, um, but as it currently stands, it, 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 involves digital scanning, a sensor, which is used in the clinic to capture the uh, patient's anatomy. Again, typically the residual limb. Some software that we've been building for many years and have had many different versions of it, um, mainly uh, and, and with the direct support of a guy named Ryan Schmidt, who is the guy who wrote Autodesk Mesh Mixer, if anybody with that. That was our starting point. The cleanup scan and rectify um, uh, residual uh, limb scans and then produce sockets. And then the printing of those sockets on a range of customized 3D printers. Uh, most of our work uh, has involved taking commodity 3D printers, which are ex relatively inexpensive, and then modifying them for higher throughput and larger sizes. Uh, you see on your screen, uh, that's actually CCBRT in Tanzania, one of our sites. Uh, they originally had TAS printers. I think that was the manufacturer, customized TAS printers. Um, but the, in the most recent uh, deployments, we've been using Creati CR10 printers, for those of you who care. Again, highly modified for increased throughput. Um, We've done a lot of work to try to validate this. Some of that has been material science work. Uh, some of that has involved um, clinical trials. We've done basically three large, uh, relatively large scale, some of the largest scale actually clinical trials that have been done in a while, um, uh, uh, which, which as you see include 180 children at four different sites, one in Cambodia, two in Tanzania, uh, and one in Uganda. That was uh, Cambodian School of Prosthetics and Orthotics in Phnom Penh. CCBRT in Tatkot in Tanzania and uh, um, Korsu Hospital near Entebbe in Uganda. Um, and our research, which I'll show you some citations about here in a second, if for those who are interested, has shown that these can be produced in much reduced time uh, than traditional plaster cast sockets and at a slightly lower cost. Though truthfully, cost has not been our main driver. It's actually been speed of production. Um, and I could go into why uh, later. 
Um, I'll show you here, and we have, we have lots of different uh, collaborations with many different um, hospitals, rehabilitation clinics, and research centers. I just want to show you this. Uh, let's see. So uh, just to get a little sense of what these processes look like, you see an older version of scanning in the top left. On the bottom right, you see one of our printers printing a socket, um, again, with a, a accelerated throughput, uh, not just in terms of the acceleration of the time of the video, but also that it's uh, pushing out more plastic. Tensile strength testing that we did, which took an incredible amount of time that really had to do with figuring out the right slicing protocols, as well as the right materials that would create durable sockets. And then uh, the big video with the KUKA robot is one of our sockets going through a 1 million step fatigue uh, test at Mobilab in uh, Belgium. Again, that was all because what we really wanted to do was validate that our, that our solutions were, um, were good. Uh, there's a range of publications that we've engaged in um, over, the, over the last few years. I'm happy to share these with anybody who wants to reach out to me. Uh, the one reason to show these though is to highlight the and prosthetists uh, and prosthetic technicians that have been involved in our process. Um, probably the most important one that you see here is the third one down, uh, which includes both me as an author, members of our research team, but also a number of prosthetists in clinics in uh, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, and uh, Cambodia. Um, but also computer scientists, including Ryan Schmidt, who I mentioned before, um, working uh, and publishing in SIGGRAPH. So we've had a lot of people involved in this. Typically in these things, I, this is what I wanna end with. Typically in a lot of these presentations, and I've done lots of them in, in myself, we show these pictures of often pediatric patients wearing our sockets proudly, wearing our AFOs proudly. You can see the, one of the AFOs there on the top right, um, people walking in the parallel bars and, and so forth and so on. But in fact, our focus, uh, and this could have been wrong or right, but, but I just wanna highlight that this was our focus, was really on the prosthetic clinics, the rehabilitation clinics, and the people and the frontline staff that run and uh, operate within those. Um, we did a number of really deep dives, and these are really partnerships, to figure out how do they work on the ground, what do they really need, and what's going to be sustainable in those contexts. And, and most of our design choices and the technologies we've built were really Really focused on a couple of things, and I'll, I'll just mention them also as, as um, I think, important guidelines for other people doing work in this context. The first was, and this is what we did, and I think it's important to do, we really wanted to support and build on local knowledge and skills, specifically those rehabilitation clinics. Um, we didn't want to come in with expertise from Toronto, where I live, or Canada, you know, from the orthopedic surgeons that we work with here or the prosthetists that we work with here, we really wanted to validate the local knowledge and, and support and build on that knowledge in order to create solutions that would work. And the other thing we really wanted to do was create solutions that were structured to fit and work in those rehabilitation clinical contexts. And so we did a lot of work developing software and hardware that was made to work in those clinics. On, one, on the right-hand side, you see one of the 3D printers that we built. Um, uh, that again, made to be relatively low capital cost, made to run within the, this, this, this is at Corsu, run in that context um, and continue to operate for an extended period of time at price points, again, that would, that would actually be deployable and sustainable. Where are we now? Um, we fit about, we've done these clinical trials that I've mentioned. We fit about 500 patients uh, over the, since again, since 2014. We completed a clinical study here in Canada in 2021, again, part of a sort of a sustainability dual market strategy that we were working on, looking for some similar prosthetic uh, context that would, that would actually potentially pay uh, in order to support the work in the LMIC context. Things were really put on hold during COVID. We're getting restarted now with the next deployment happening in Sri Lanka sometime in late 2022 or 2023. Um, and with that, I'll just thank the organizers again and, and say, if you, if you have any questions or uh, want to know any more, feel free to take a look at neotech.org, the nonprofit website, or reach out to me and I'm happy to share um, anything I can. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. That was fantastic. Um, I think, you know, both, both yours uh, and Laura's presentation just show two different approaches, but really addressing some of the same 
core issues that uh, that um, Mengistu brought up in his presentation. So thank you. I mean, it was, it was excellent to hear. Um, the question that I had for both you and for Laura, and maybe Mengistu can also comment from the Ethiopian perspective. I mean, Mengistu brought up the issue of cost, right? I mean, for sustainability right now, um, you know, ICRC, other NGOs are basically donating these implants. In the future, if we imagine, and I think Laura, you mentioned this concept of, of like a um, sort of a micro loan kind of system where you can um, somehow subsidize the cost and allow somebody to purchase a, a prosthesis and deal with the upkeep of it and then somehow pay that back over time. I mean, the two of you guys, you know, Laura and Matt, who just presented, what, what is your vision for the future of increasing the, you know, financial accessibility of prostheses for the poorest people, the marginalized people of this world who have also the highest burden of these injuries and the most to lose potentially when they can no longer walk to market, walk in the fields, these sorts of things. Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, maybe we can start with Matt since you just presented and then we'll go to Laura. Um, so I'm gonna say something that Laura may disagree with or, or other people here too might. Um, we were trying to meet the current cost. So in Uganda at, at Corsu using the ICRC system, it costs about $300 for a transtibial below the knee prosthetic, uh, all in uh, labor, cost of the polypropylene extruded components and so forth and so on. We were trying to meet that cost, not necessarily make it lower, primarily because what we saw and what our clinics have told us is that cost is not always the main barrier to access. The main barrier to access, at least in many of the clinics we work with, um, had to do with lack of access to prosthetic capacity and knowledge. They they literally could not produce a device any faster than about one per week. And so that was what reduced the capacity, at least to serve the, the uh, pediatric patients that were the primary uh, focus. So even if they went out and fundraised, in fact, they did as part of our work, we went out and fundraised with them to uh, basically create these sort of boluses of prosthetic uh, uh, capacity, you know, so $300 a device, we go out and raise, you know, 3,000, dollars and you've got an extra 200 prosthetics. Problem was, even with that, they couldn't serve that population. So uh, in our case, it's not just about price, it's also about what can this, what can the clinics actually produce and provide? Um, and our goal was to accelerate that with, with the goal of increasing access. Yeah, uh, Laura, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I agree that um, actually the lack of um, skilled personnel and uh, yeah, resources in order to make prosthetics one of, especially for the socket part, because of course components then can be uh, adjusted in a very simple way or faster. But uh, we also need to think from our perspective, because we are also placing ourselves at that rate, like um, price level more or less of ICRC, uh, as you might just range, uh, mentioned. But, in, for our side, it's very important to see the, the long-term cost because we are not just talking about, like we really try to, to develop a prosthesis that is not just available because often the amputees, they need them to uh, exchange it and to replace it. And many of the uh, prosthetics um, that are available on the market, they need to, to be replaced after one or two years. And we all even saw that sometimes, like even on the shelves, they get deteriorated and people cannot really use them. So it's really thinking like a bit a long-term and of course, the, the big problem is to access at the beginning. So how do we make sure that um, more people can access from upfront and then like can actually benefit from the prosthetics? And that's why we started to think about developing uh, financial mechanisms that, that can be more inclusive or creating, for instance, a fund. Uh, also, I mean, supported by the government, but as well from communities. We saw that many of the entities actually did fundraise themselves also in communities. And this can be like, um, or like from donors. So created an initial fund from where actually entities can, uh, um, can then benefit and then slowly repay back, for instance, part of the prosthetics. Uh, so it's a collaboration with different institutions. I don't think that just the providers can, uh, by lowering the cost can actually solve the, the issue but uh, it will entail much more like collaboration in different like uh, levels. Yeah, it's a very complex uh, problem. I mean, you know, th there is obviously a link between um, finances and economics and increasing productivity by giving patients access to prostheses, implants, access to good quality surgery and rehabilitation. 
all this, you know, there is an economic argument there, but linking it up one patient at a time so one patient can benefit and then create a sustainable system is really challenging. And so I think I, I really commend you for thinking about this sort of process and how it can work for your patients in Kenya and in East Africa in general. Um, we're, we're at the end here. I just wanted to give Mengistu a chance. Uh, thank you for those of you who are gonna hang on for a little while longer. Mengistu, do you have any comments from what Matt and Laura just presented? Uh, thank you, Kiran. <clears throat> I, I completely agreed with uh, Bozo's presentation, probably with uh, regarding to the cost. Yeah, it is really expensive. I mean, uh, unless it is supported with NGOs, unless it was, it's used to be supported by ICRC, it would have been really expensive for Ethiopian population. Uh, for uh, some centers, they will go and uh, they will get the service with $110 USD, I mean which is equivalent to around 6,000 uh, Ethiopian birth. And even that is uh, expensive to them. Most of, for most of the people, it is really expensive. I know uh, it may be deserved or it may be even low uh, to pay $300, but uh, for Ethiopian and the most low middle income country population, it is too expensive. Uh, there are a lot of uh, tragedies that we see in uh, our clinic, I mean, even they can't afford uh, to buy some uh, medical supplies and others. Uh, in general, uh, I can say like this tumor, which will lead for amputation and the severe infection, and others even, it's like, like a disease of the poor. So uh, most of them, they will, uh, they will not afford at all, uh, live alone for the amputation. That's why they will disappear from uh, clinical clinic follow-up and uh, they come very late and when they ask, when we ask them, they would say like, no, I can't afford it. And I didn't uh, see at all the process. Anyways, we need, to, uh, we need to design some system. We, need, we should not neglect them as they are discriminated by the community. Uh, I don't know how to create. It needs a collaboration of a lot of things. Uh, government itself, they need to assign adequate budget for uh, this purpose. The, they should not leave it. Uh, the private uh, organization, NHOs and others, uh, we need to have, we need to deliver still a, a low cost, low cost processes. That's my thinking. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mengis, too. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, we're over time. I'm sure there are many other questions there. If we could just hang on for three more minutes um, and, and leave it open. Are there any questions from the, uh, from the audience um, for our speakers before we end the session here? No. All right. Well, that's okay. Oh, oh there have. we go. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, this is more directed towards Matt, I believe, but um, I was wondering why you guys aren't reaching out to the Middle East and what the barriers might be to there. I know there's a lot of war torn regions that are in need of prosthetics. Um, so we have, we've done some work with Prince Sultan in Saudi Arabia, that, that's not exactly the sites that you're probably thinking of, um, and we've done, we've, we've started, we've tried to reach out and tried to do some work with um, some Syrian uh, um, volunteer organizations working out of Turkey and other places. Um, the problems that we've had, the, the main, uh, there's two thing, reasons why that hasn't happened. So one is because uh, we work with uh, Hope and Healing International, which operates uh, and primarily funds a range of private hospitals in Africa and Southeast Asia. And getting into those hospitals and providing services there has just been a lot easier. The need there is also, uh, also our focus has been on pediatric patients. Uh, and, and the need has been higher uh, in, in some of those places than in, in Syria, um, for example. Um, the other is, is that our goal has never been to move into, say, refugee camps, set up pop-up prosthetic clinics, and then bail. Like our goal has always been to support existing rehabilitation clinics and help them scale up to treat more uh, users. Um, and a lot of those things are not yet in place, uh, serving some of those refugee populations, but we're hoping that we're going to get there. Um, one of the reasons for that, by the way, is, and I think... Um, Dr. Mangesha mentioned it um, uh, specifically, it's that prosthetic care is not over when somebody gets a device. I actually, Laura did too, I'm sure. Um, you know, prosthetic care is a longstanding process um, and in our, our, sense of, our sense, it needs a clinical context and a range of clinical professionals and paraprofessionals providing that, or there's, no, there's really no good outcome. So that's been, our, that's been part of our rationale. Hopefully that helps. 
Yeah, no, thank you. It's a really good question. And it highlights like, you know, a challenging balance between obviously the need to create sustainability, but also address these humanitarian crises, like we're seeing in Ukraine, like we're seeing in Ethiopia, like we're seeing in the Middle East, where there's so many, uh, you know, in Syria, people who are on the move, uh, who need prostheses to move, to migrate, to change location, and, and just don't have access to these basic things. So no, I mean, huge challenges, but really uh, remarkable uh, talks from all of our speakers today. Um, so we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. I'm sure we could all continue talking. Uh, Sophia, do you wanna uh, take us out? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you to everyone who was able to make it today and stick around. Thank you to the panelists. Um, you're all doing incredible work and um, really, really working to combat this problem. So we appreciate you and appreciate you being here. Um, just to wrap up, please follow us on, please follow HGOC on social media. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel at Harvard Global Orthopedics Collaborative. And we also are on Twitter at OrthoGlobal. Um, and Kieran put in a chat for another webinar that you can look at for those interested. And that's all we have. Anything else, Kieran? Um, for those who are interested in spine trauma, we also have an upcoming um, uh, virtual educational conference in July, two sessions. It'll be both in Spanish and in English uh, with our colleagues in Mexico on spine trauma um, uh, in, in the Mexican context and the resource context. Um, but yeah, we'll continue to put out these webinars, have these sorts of conversations. Really appreciate this. This is hopefully just the beginning of a conversation. So thank you all very much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.